Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Steph. How you doing? No. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Today we're talking about a subject I really like. I don't know how you feel about this subject, but the inner critic. I don't know why I really like this subject. I think it's because I had such a strong one, but my inner critic was like me. And so having watched myself go through the evolution of no longer having such a strong one, I I find this to be a really empowering topic and Mm -hmm. want to have a lot to say about. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because I was, as I was editing some past episodes, like it comes up again and again that your inner critic didn't seem as strong. You had so much more self-compassion, I feel like, (laughs) from the beginning. It seems that way. That is so interesting. You started with that because I was going to talk about this because I was thinking about, you know, the episode when we read out our journal entries and you were like, you're actually quite nice to yourself. Yeah. And I went away thinking, am I? Like, I don't, I don't feel like I am. <laughs> and so I was thinking about it. And what I think it is, is actually, so when I was really struggling with my binge eating, kind of prior to this eating disorder kicking my ass, I think I was very proud about admitting Mm. those things. So for me, it's almost like I wouldn't allow myself to go down that self-critical route because I couldn't admit to myself that that was how I really felt. So I had to, it was almost more of a denial thing. So I had to twist it around as quickly as possible and try to focus on the positives and what I could actually do. So I would say I'm much more aware of my critical voice today than I was back when I was in my eating disorder. How I experienced it was just a feeling as opposed to an actual strong narrative. Does that make sense? Yeah. But so interesting. I feel the opposite. (laughs) (laughs) My inner critic, I was like, there was no desire in me to hide it. I mean, it didn't embarrass me at all. There was no part of me that felt ashamed of it. In fact, I felt more like, please, everyone know that I do not approve of myself. I don't want to, I don't want anyone thinking I do because it was almost like an excuse of it. And I was so comfortable in self-criticism. Does it relate to the environment we're brought up in? Or like, how do we develop this voice? And so interesting that you would say that you have more of an awareness of it now, because perhaps I'm sure part of it is human, you know, well, to what degree is it human? And is there a productive self-critic versus a demoralizing, you know, oppressive one? Mm -hmm. But firstly, you saying that it blows my mind that you could feel so comfortable with other people knowing you thought badly of yourself. That to me is so against my conditioning. It's almost like thinking, well, if everybody else sees me as being okay, then I must be something at least close to being okay, even if I don't quite feel it, even if there's a a dissonance in the way I feel, Mm. I'm trying to maybe even like an element of self-delusion the word denial just feels quite fitting here so what I would do is when I felt like I messed up or I failed or I was stuck was I would feel terrible and then I would convince myself it was okay and things were going to be different and so I, I noticed this this week when I was thinking about preparing for this episode I had a moment this week so basically Stephanie I have screwed my taxes up again this year and I did this the year before last and got myself. Account? I've had three in the last year. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of the problem. Okay. So I got myself just in such a mess. And I, I really caught myself beating myself up about it. Mm-hmm. I thought, how on earth could, because I messed up one year, the next year I was much more prudent and on the case. And then this year I let it slip and have just been in complete confusion about it. So I start beating myself up for my spending. I start beating myself up for not being more responsible, for not taking more uh, care of my finances. What I would have done in the past and what has got me into trouble was just almost like burying my head in the sand. So it's this swing between I'm either ignoring it (laughs) or I'm having a bit of a go at myself about it. And I Mm. caught myself doing it. And when I noticed what I was doing, 
I, I said to myself, Sarah, just forgive yourself. Mm. Yeah. And those were the words. And I felt this resistance to that. I was like, no, I don't want to forgive myself. I just want to not be like this. Yeah. And I came back to Sarah, just forgive yourself, like, let it go. And I, mm. I say I was able to, I can still feel it when I talk about it here. But in that moment, I stopped going on at myself because it was all, then it just descended into all the poor financial decisions I made. And mm-hmm. I should have got on the property ladder years ago etc but I would never have let myself do that before or also another thing with the journaling was there was no way I would have written that down on paper even if I had thought at the time (laughs) because I don't want a record of that because that's not who I want to be and to write it on paper all that criticism for me almost made it more real well to me it was like oh I'm getting there before you do admitting it and writing it down was kind of like you can't hurt me before I do I already know I'm all these things. So me setting that on on the outset is my protection because I will never be caught unaware. You will never criticize me for something that I didn't know already. Mm -hmm. Um, So to me, it felt very safe to be the one calling it out. And also I was comfortable in the identity for whatever reason. I think this speaks back to the humility episode. I've always had this instinct to be like, I am what I am. I need to lay this all out. Everyone needs to know what I'm not and what I am so that so that it doesn't catch me unaware later. And the other piece was for all of the th- my shortcomings, which are several, many, for example, like even with money and finances, like my husband has a role in our house, which is like he, <laughs> he's everything I'm not. So he, I've been able to say I'm not good at X, Y, and Z. I'm not responsible with X, Y, and Z. I'm not, this isn't my forte. So the places where I sort of fall short, I'm willing to admit because number one, I have someone who to kind of like carry that for me and it's the way we work as a team. But also I feel comfortable now with the things I'm not. Like I think before there was a lot of resistance about, I thought I should be more, Uh, I've talked about this before. Like I was called flighty as a kid or I was called like, I was interested in this for a hot minute. And then I was interested in this and I would sort of like bumble all around. And I always saw this as like really, what's the word for that besides flighty? Um, Inconsistent, unreliable, um, fickle. Flaky? Flaky. Uh, There was a time of my life where this critic was so strong, but the critic is in place to make you feel like you can't be that. You need to be different. You're not good enough if you're like that. And I feel like the way that my critic has developed is to say, there are parts of me that lean this way. And in certain situations, it can be less than desirable for me. Like, I don't want to be this way for reasons X, Y, and Z. But in other ways, these things can look like A, B, and C. Like, that can also lend itself to being like really interested in a lot of things and collecting a lot of information about a lot of things and also being flexible. Like I can move from this to this. So when I put the light on it in those ways, I can understand how these qualities can be channeled into ways that work for me, just as they can be channeled into ways that don't. So seeing them as less of you are this thing that is so bad, it's how are we moving this thing? How are we working with this thing? How, how in the acceptance of this thing do we surrender the criticism around it? You know what I mean? I outsource things that I'm not good at or the things that I don't want to be doing. So it's a self-awareness of this isn't my strong suit. So I'm not going to pretend that it is. <laughs> um, and I'm going to find ways to manage this in my life in other ways and use it where I can in positive ways. Mm-hmm. And that's how my critic changed. It started to stop only looking at the negative side of it and to also recognize, well, you're also self-aware enough to know that you're like that and not to deny it. So you make it work for you. It's just popped into my head, actually, a memory of maybe about a year after my mom died. My mom died nearly 12 years ago now. I was talking to a very close friend of mine and she was saying how when her mom dies, she just doesn't think she'll cope. She thinks she would just fall apart. And she said to me, you know, I'm not, I'm not like you. I, I can't just be okay. Mm. She goes, I'm not that strong and I can't just be okay. I remember she said, and I remember in that moment, like actually feeling quite hurt by that, which was an interesting um, response because there's definitely something for me around being a burden to people and trying to seem okay, but then feeling really disappointed if people don't notice that I'm not okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
but kind of not wanting them to see that I'm not okay either. It's like an impasse Mm. and I get stuck in that place. So for me, it was really dismantling defenses because what I realized was I had a lot of defenses up. And as I broke down those defenses, it felt like my whole identity was breaking apart. It was a really scary time to let that in. But it was a necessary part of the healing was to be honest in about the ways that I was struggling and about the ways that I was unhappy, even to myself. And then in therapy and a bit more so with other people in my life. But that's the conditioning. The conditioning runs deep. And a lot of the time, I don't think I really hear the critical voice as a critical voice because it feels like my critical voice doesn't feel like it's trying to tear me down. It's trying to build me up, but I'm just feeling like I can't keep up. Mm. Does that make sense? And so I've been told I push myself a lot. I don't see it. (laughs) I always walk around with that feeling at the visceral level, like I'm not pushing myself hard enough. And how did this show up in food or, and or body? I'd have a set idea about how I thought I should be eating and it wasn't realistic. So I felt like I was failing at that over and over again. For me, there was, with the binge eating started, there was such a sense, such a loss of control that I'd never experienced anywhere in my life before. So it suddenly came out and it felt sudden. It suddenly came out with food. So it threatened everything that I believed about myself Mm. and my capabilities and my capacity for self-control. Okay. And so it was very threatening to go into that and admit the the part of me that wasn't in control because I always felt pretty in control of myself. Interesting. I see the way you and I are playing out here in clients, right? So there's a subset of people who it's almost like this is that area where they don't have it. And it's so it's like, hide this, this is, this is inconsistent with everything. And it's humiliating versus someone like me who is like, yeah, this is evidence of everything I knew. See, you know, kind of like, this is how I am. And it's so interesting. Like I'm trying to wrap my head around not being like this, like me, (laughs) like, like what it's, it's so safe to me to be critical and to not be is almost, it it just feels so foreign to me. No, 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 no. (laughs) I see it the other way around. For me, if I were to believe that's who I was and I were to really believe all those critical things about myself, I'd collapse. I would never try. I, I don't feel like I would get anywhere. If I were to believe that I was X, Y, Z, that would be how I behaved day in day out I couldn't do anything differently I have to tell myself that I'm not that to try and not be that whatever the critical Hmm. belief is I'm having about myself well I mean as you said I'm like well yeah I did collapse on myself like that's exactly what happened I also think though I don't know if any listeners would agree there was this critic voice that was pulling me down and convincing you know being like yeah this is you you jerk you know at the end of the day this is what you are But under it, deep, deep under it, I think that I also had a sense that I wasn't that or that like the like the critic voice was almost this oppressor that was convincing me of something. And I believed it, but there was maybe it wasn't under it. Maybe it was next to it that I also believed that I could be something not that I believed in more maybe what you would call my authentic self or my essential self that that existed too, but I couldn't access it. And so I had no proof that it existed, but I did have a feeling that this wasn't all there was. And so these things lived alongside themselves. And, and I think that the, this authentic self was quieter. And I don't know that I consciously believed that she existed, but I think I felt that she did. And I think that was the difference. And in the journey of evolving myself critic, which I, I, I was thinking about this, like, to what extent does that self-critic live now? And I don't, I'm, yes, there's parts of me that's like, oh, like, why'd you do that? Or, you know, but I don't speak to myself in that way. So it's not that there's these two sides that are vying against each other anymore. It's kind of like acceptance of the things about me that are not my favorite, <laughs> Um but also this supportive voice that's like, I don't even know if it's supportive. It is a bit. That's kind of like, I accept that. 
I accept that. And and that to me has shifted. It takes away the oppression because when you don't have anyone shaming you, when you're like, yeah, okay, what's so bad about that? Lean into that a little even. Um, then the oppressor has nowhere to go. And it's, mm -hmm. it becomes... Then there's an, it's then safety it, it just ceases to be relevant. You don't have to hide from something anymore. You don't have to like cower. It's it's it becomes just a, a completely like here's what we got. Like this is what is. And you do we want to lay down and die or do we want to move forward? And I don't know. That's sort of how I feel about it now. Mm -hmm. So if you could just give us a little taste, couple of sentences of how your inner critic would have sounded back then just give me a couple of sentences should we do uh, or like around food that's yes. the easiest one yeah okay um let's say i'd had a binge or started having a binge i was like yeah. first of all if the critic was it felt like almost like i sort of disassociated a little bit because it felt like i had to numb myself to this voice but the voice would be um you're such an idiot like i can't believe that you're doing this again. You are never going to learn. You are pretty much always going to be like that. And you, you maybe you deserve to be like that. You're weak and you always were. And it's ridiculous that you ever thought you could be anything but. You better sit back down in your corner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you did that in the second person, in the you. You didn't say I. Yeah. So when I hear somebody talking about their critical voice, I think it's much more dangerous, it's harder, it's more deep set when people are saying I, I than when it's you. It's like this tape. So some people, they talk about eating disorders as that is the voice, it's the eating disorder voice. And that's what that sounded like when you spoke then. Mm -hmm. And actually when I come in with you, my you tends to be the kinder voice and my I less so. Mm. So it'd be what's wrong with me? Why am I doing this again? That's my frustration with myself. When actually a lot of the time I'll say, like when I said, come on, Sarah, forgive yourself. That was in the second person. Yeah, I'm the opposite, Sarah. I'm just <laughs> realizing now. Because my if you'd ask me next what my, what my voice says now, it's I. Mm. Huh. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I always get clients to think about it. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule that it always means this when it's I and it always means that if it's you. But I get people to change it around. So when they catch it and they're saying you, get them to try and say I and just see how it feels dif different. Well, I'll, I can tell you, like, I feel like if I had said I, if I had used that, it would have felt very uncomfortable just interesting I I don't I don't know if I could have criticized myself that harshly if I was saying I it would have you know I just said that there was this disassociation there was mm -hmm. that numbing that's why it, it, if the you made it not I didn't person I did personalize it but also not I think that it was almost like this voice is talking at me and it's not mine mm -hmm. And if you can survive that voice and everything it throws at you, nothing anyone else says that's going to make it any worse. Yeah, right. Yeah. To me, this is going to be an interesting conversation to see how yours plays out versus mine. But my, I do believe that moving into self-compassion and it was the moving into the eye, was me becoming more in me and saying, what do I believe instead of what does this voice believe and not dissociating. So not mm -hmm. having that any longer. How did but yours evolve or how did you evolve? How do you speak now? Well, now I think this is the strange thing. It's almost like the words are more seem more critical, but that's because I wasn't really aware of the words before. Yeah. It was such a felt sense. So to actually be able to admit to myself when I'm feeling things that I might perceive as being, or when I, when I feel like I've fallen short of my own expectations. I think previously there was just this, frustration that I didn't know what to do with and so I ate now I actually have to hear what the frustration says so I have to listen to my frustrated voice I wouldn't call it critical I would mm. call it frustrated I get frustrated with myself easily sometimes sometimes not easily I guess it kind of depends where I'm at at the moment easily just because I'm having that those kinds of days so actually it was putting words onto what I felt. And these weren't words that I was consciously thinking before, 
I was really trying to make sense of this this week when I was thinking about how is it that I'm I'm say these things to myself that I didn't before and that's because I was just retelling the story and I'm not saying that there isn't a place for retelling a story because we get to make up our story but I had to discard you know if we're talking about authenticity and what my actual truth in that moment was it's making my head hurt (laughs) well I I feel compelled to ask you and Mm. we can erase this if you don't like the question but what do you think of yourself right now I think well it depends when you ask me I've had just a difficult week so how I'm feeling now at the end of this week I think I'm feeling a little it's just been a tricky week with a lot of things that have come up. So my resources feel quite low. And because my resources are low and my energy is very low, that for me, I think is the difference. When my energy is low, that's the thing that frustrates me more than anything and, and affects how I, how I am judging myself, yes. I think is probably the best way to put it. Because there's always that sense of, okay, I'm feeling tired. Should I be pushing myself or should I be resting? And never feeling like I'm never listen to me with my black and white talking. <laughs> That's just how I'm feeling at the moment. I'm feeling at the moment, I'm feeling like I'm never getting it right. I try and push myself and I'm like, nope, that wasn't a good idea. And then I rest and I think, nope, should have pushed myself. I'd have felt better. So I think I'm just feeling particularly itchy at the moment. But if I were to try and speak about it from my baseline level, the place that I keep coming back to is the word I want to say is trust. Hmm. And what I wanted to say was actually trusting life. And that, that's a strange thing to come well, Maybe it's not. It felt like a strange thing for that to come into my head when you were asking me about myself. But I guess my assessment of myself is often related to what I perceive my relationship with life to be like at that moment so when I'm tired I'm disconnected I talk about feeling disconnected all the time it's been the thing that I really find challenging so when I feel disconnected in order to reconnect I have to just let go and I have to trust because I become more disconnected when I go to those places of I should be this I should be doing this I should not be doing this things should be like this, things should be like that. I have to catch those stories because those are the things that I suppose just affect how I'm feeling, yeah, about myself at any given time. Well, I think that you, that makes a good point is that when our capacity is lower, when our fatigue is higher, that the critic makes more of an entrance. I think we're more vulnerable at those times. I think it's also when we're sick or when we've got a lot of stress. Um, any time that that our system is overburdened, we've only got so much room. And I think that that's a time where these these voices come up more. As someone who struggles with, I always like Ben, I think I'm changing my perspective on struggles with, someone who, who deals with um, anxiety and depression at different times. For me, the way life and trusting in life comes into play with it is recognizing that at any given moment, if I'm having a week where I'm feeling this way, where I'm feeling like my capacity is so low, I feel like I'm not doing anything right. I feel like, you know, this catastrophizing that I am much more able to say, yeah, that's where I am now. It's not a truth with a capital T. Life ebbs and flows. And I certainly do, too. Like I do. And this has been my truth for so long. I think since adolescence, since like hormones kicked in, I think at that point, my life was no longer stable or I didn't feel stable anymore. And I think for 20 some odd years, I kept trying to be the person that I was when I was the best, felt the felt the best. And that isn't what it is. It ne- I don't think it ever will be. And I completely like, so that's where the critic would come in and be like, you're not this. And it's like, yeah, I'm not. Because right now I'm in an ebb, like Mm -hmm. I'm not, and I will go back to a flow maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe in a a while. And this does change. Like sometimes it's daily or hourly and sometimes it's seasonally. So there's no room. I don't need to criticize it. It's just kind of saying, this is where I'm at, at the moment. So even if you say, you know, I'm feeling like I can never do things right. You're never, you feel like you can never do things right, right now, but that doesn't mean always. It doesn't really mean never, just means never right now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that that to me has shifted my experience of the critic because I no longer have to categorize myself as something static. It's just the experience of the moment 
So in that sense, I don't have to define myself by anything. It doesn't have to be like my definition because there's no plateau. There's no getting to some place where I'm always going to be this one characteristic or not. It's, mm -hmm. it, it moves. Yeah. Massively relate to all of that. I'm now thinking about somebody who might be listening, who really relates to having a very critical voice in their mind. And it does feel like just them or the truth of who they are. I'm sure you have as well worked with people who constantly have that voice saying you are worthless you are this you don't deserve this you don't even deserve to recover mm -hmm. was yours ever like that was it ever around what you deserved and how did that actually shift from not deserving to deserving something more yes uh I did <clears throat> believe that and again this I think this goes back to this separation between I and you um, I think that I thought you don't deserve this. And there came a point where, and I also want to say that this didn't just happen because I just, it just, I decided that it should, it was, I think there were things in place in my life at the time when I was able to do this, that were like foundational. For example, I had, I was no longer living with my family of origin. I was married and I had, I have a supportive husband who is a rock in many ways. He's just extremely steady, sometimes annoyingly, like it is annoying <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> like he's just like too steady. But anyway, I needed him to be because I could then steady myself. So I had a, a support system that was safe. I could then say, I don't think, I don't think I deserve the not deserving. Like it felt like, wait a minute, I started to question this, voice of you don't deserve it you're not good enough i think that i got i got rebellious and i always talk with you know binge eating that there's this inner rebel um there's a comply there's a compliant in the restriction and there's a rebel in, i think in this binging and that rebel that i always called a self sabotage like that was also what i would call self sabotage no 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 this was my ally this was someone who was saying no you you're more than this. Like you don't deserve to be put in this box. And that voice got louder for me where it was like, maybe I, why do I think I don't deserve this? Like, maybe that isn't true. Why do I think that? Just objectively, it seemed mean, you know, just, and even though I believed it about myself, I had these two conversations going on where there was this one person completely bought into that, identified as that critic versus this other voice that started to question, is that true? Like who said who told you that? Who taught you that? And when I have clients, one of the features of my coaching is WhatsApp. So we talk daily on WhatsApp. And the reason that I do that is because a client will leave me a voice memo or a text. And some clients will leave just like, I did it again, da, 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 the way that they're talking is like, and I'll come back and say, this kind of almost mirror what they've just said, like, this is what this is what you just said about yourself. And when, when somebody can hear themselves doing that or like put it out in the world and hear that someone's hearing them say that or write that, it becomes real. And then all of a sudden you can look at it like, oh, I'm like, I think when it's in your head, you think it's just true. It's just what you are and who you are. But when you put it in the world and someone else witnesses it, you're like, oh, that's really cruel. And mm -hmm. I can see that you're pointing this out that that's not that's not okay. You know what I mean? Like someone's saying like, look at this, this isn't, this isn't what you deserve. Um, and for me, that was how that evolved. But it, I do have the caveat now of saying that I think that there were these prerequisites of having some kind of safe space in order to be able to explore that. Um, I don't know that I would have been able to come to that or accept that or do that in a place of emotional chaos. Did Mike know anything about how critical you were and how you felt about yourself at that time oh yeah oh I yeah. openly spoke of it oh yeah, yeah. he knew everything <laughs> so do you think then one of the things that perhaps we need is for somebody to see our worthiness first does that make sense to enable you to question it because your Mike in shining armor is not seeing you like that <laughs> Mike thought highly of me but I didn't care no I I didn't need that didn't inspire me like it wasn't like he sees me as this so I know because mm -mm. I had friends who thought highly of me too all that time and and I was like what are you talking I, no you're just my friend you're just being nice um but it was more about 
Mike does not judge me. And he, there's nothing I seem to be able to do that pushes him away. And he saw all of my criticism. And again, my criticism was my way of saying, I am this. You can't call it out before I do. So it was like he knew all the things because I told him them. <laughs> it's not like he witnessed, like he didn't witness my binging or any of the other stuff. I was just like, this is what I did. <laughs> this is what I do. This is what I think. This is who I am. And he was like, okay, I'm still here. And in that, it wasn't like I felt worth. I just felt safe. I felt like there's someone who's not going to go and I can co-regulate with that. Um, I can use that as like, because up until that point, I don't think I had ever felt that sense of an, a, something to hold on to. Everything felt so fluid and conditional. So he was this place of like, I can feel free to now explore things that feel unsafe to me, like compassion. <laughs> knowing that there is somewhere I can go back to that isn't moving. Um, yeah, that's how I saw mm -hmm. that support system working for me. So how can people create that for themselves if they don't have a supportive partner that's going to come in and stay and, and hold it? I think about that a lot um, because I have clients who have who don't have hardly any support systems. And that's where I feel like therapy, therapy and coaching, as far as I like, that's one as perspective on it is that that is a lot of what that role feels like. It feels like being someone who is unconditional and who doesn't judge and who is safe um, to be able to put that. And I don't know how you feel about that as a therapist, but as a coach, the interaction is so daily and it's meant to handhold and to be. I know ethically that can be different in therapy, but coaching has that freedom. And I, and I find that that's why I became one because I, I wanted to be someone who, if you have nothing else, you have someone to talk to, who's going to respond to you every day. Who's going to listen, who's going to hear it, who's going to be there. Um, and I do consider myself to be a non-judgmental person. So I, I, I think that comes through. And I think that if that's where you begin, of course, I, you know, that we want to cultivate things beyond that, but I think that that's, if, that can be a beginning point. And I've seen that be true for, for some people. Mm -hmm. And of course there's, if you can't afford coaching, there's always communities. <laughs> now insert music. <laughs> I will not put it there. <laughs> we love connecting with our listeners. So we host regular community events on zoom. We also have a private Facebook group for our Patreon supporters. Please visit our website, lifeafterdietspodcast.com to find out more. For more details about how to contact us or to work with Sarah or Steph individually, please check out the show notes. Now let's get back to the episode. Do you know Eckhart Tolle? Mm -hmm. Well, his whole moment of awakening, he was saying how he absolutely hated himself. He didn't want to live. He couldn't bear being himself. He was so full of loathing. And one day he has this thought, I can't live with myself anymore. This was the awakening thought for him because he realized that in that center, there was the, do you know what I'm going to say? Do you know? It? Yes. Yeah. The I and the myself. Yeah. There's two bits in there. So he was like, am I two people here? What is, what is this? Who's the I who can't live with the self? And that just created this sort of non-identified state. It all sounds very magical and wonderful for people for whom that critical voice has become so familiar, finding a way to separate that voice as being yeah okay it lives in your head maybe it is a part of you maybe you depersonalize it and think about it as not a part of you but either way the voice itself isn't you and if the voice is talking to you in the you like yours was you're this you're that the voice doesn't necessarily know what it's talking about <laughs> chances are it's just messages and interjections of experiences perhaps you've had where you have been judged um, that have helped to create this voice and that would be the first thing I'd want people to think about when they're trying to figure out what their critical voice is like. And there are also feelings, I think. Go on. I think sometimes that critic can be feelings that we don't know what to do with. Uh -huh. Like when I think about that now, I think about how I was angry or I was sad or I was frustrated or overwhelmed. And I did not know how to process that as a feeling. So I turned it into a, they, it just, it just fueled criticism energy. Yeah. And one of the biggest ways I think that people's inner monologue or dialogue, depending how you're talking to yourself, really 
gets in the way for people in this work is the whole comparison part, right? The voice mm -hmm. that goes, oh, well, that person over there, they're able to do this, or I must be the worst binge eater in the world. I was doing some writing the other day and I was thinking about this idea of how I used to honestly think that I was worse than other binge eaters, not necessarily specifically in quantities, but, and I wrote down my reasons. And one of my reasons why I was worse than other binge eaters was, and I remember saying this to my therapist once, where's my trauma? Where's mm. my reason for being this messed up when it comes to food? I cannot believe that I am this screwed up with food and I don't even have a trauma or something to blame it on. My parents didn't put me on a diet when I was younger. I didn't, I didn't have that moment that some people talk about where somebody said something about their body that then made them self-conscious. So I thought that was one reason, especially that I clung on to, whereby there must be something so wrong with me because other people clearly had something that caused this and I didn't. That was one mm. of mine that I carried. So mm. it was carried as a belief as opposed to a conscious thought that came out in like an explicit sentence in my mind, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that, that's another rabbit hole of uh, like trauma doesn't have to be like it's, I mean, even as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, if you had this tendency to pretend that your emotions weren't there or like that they needed to be better or more positive perhaps your binges were like enough <laughs> like, you know what I mean? like we are here you know and I I think sometimes we don't give credit to the ways in which we are being spoken to and communicated with through our body that doesn't necessarily have to be rooted in a trauma with a capital t it's simply a, an authenticity message um that's my belief about it. That's why in, in conversations we've have a, had about like potential relapsing, where I feel like I couldn't relapse because I know this too much now. I believe that like, that there's reasons and that we're not broken because we're broken. There's these things, there's these th ways that these things make sense. And in knowing that, I think that shame releases and, and therefore the critic is like, well, it kind of has less legs to stand on. So for someone taking in all of this information it's like okay but what do I do <laughs> what's the first thing I do um concretely what would you say <laughs> I thought you were gonna wrap it up with your thoughts and then you throw it to me <laughs> fine I will tell you <laughs> just for listeners to know I said that I was gonna finish and then I just threw it at her um it is questioning it is hearing that voice and understanding it might not be the I in the sentence, that it might not be your truest, co most essential self, and injecting doubt, at least, even if you still buy into it, you know, even if you still are like, yeah, I, I'm injecting doubt, and I still err on the side of the critic, that even in the act of questioning the voice as not necessarily your own, but that you can feel free to agree with or not agree with, it is, I, I believe, what begins the process of, of having this separation from your critic. And along that line, I just wanted to add something about not arguing with the voice. If you try and convince the voice, if you get in that conversation and you're trying to convince the voice itself to back down and say, yes, OK, I relent, I'll go away. It doesn't do that because it's like a fixed thing. So exactly just repeating what you've just said ultimately Steph but that's something I often say is like just that casting doubt so sometimes I will catch a thought about myself and then I'll say mm, that might not be true I don't know and I can't decide when I'm in a frustrated state when I'm experiencing this emotion but I can revisit this when I'm feeling a bit calmer when I'm feeling a bit more grounded and see if there is anything in here that needs my attention there was something about recognizing my emotional state and not making decisions in yeah. a heightened emotional state that was crucial yeah. for me in life really not just with food yeah and real quick here's another one I love this tool sometimes it's like go ahead and agree with it and then ask so <laughs> like, there's been times where I've like I have a critic saying something I'm like yeah that's true <laughs> so you know, and like, I, I find that to be, that disarms the critic. <laughs> like it's not, it's not expecting that one. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right. Okay. 
um we've done some pretty smooth outros recently and then have it's been disappointing (laughs) (laughs) so we would do one that we couldn't get out of but um yeah 